With different work that I've done throughout my life, those moments where you're really connected manifest differently. More recently, with my work that's much more physical and performative, you're connected a lot more of the time. The physical act of creating, it can kind of be a bridge to like a more direct connection to like the meditative state that's connected to the soul. They say that yoga is like that, like you do the physical activity of yoga to exhaust yourself so that your thoughts don't get in the way of the connection to your real self or to your soul or to your beingness. You exhaust yourself to go into meditation. With my work, it's similar. It's, it's when I exhaust myself physically or when I'm so involved physically with doing the work, that's when I get to those moments, kind of a little more divine. I don't think that those magical moments are usually too connected to thought. I think they're more intuitive and natural. My name is Christine Angelina, also known as Starfighter. I am a graffiti artist or street artist. I've been drawing and painting ever since I was like really little. It was always kind of something that I was fixated on. I started to experiment with other mediums as I got older. Photography, spray paint, wheat paste, a bunch of different things, film. But drawing it branched into painting was a thing that I always did. I know that I was drawing and painting since before I have a memory of it. I, I, it was something I did since I was like two or three years old. I would doodle on everything and on the walls and on the books and... And whether it was paint or pencil or crayons or whatever, I would always be scribbling on something. What kind of car is it? It was something that I never stopped doing. I always. Uh, I don't know what created the, the impetus to draw or paint, but I, I did it. I always did it. And as I got older, it, I developed it into a real skill that got better and better at. You know, when I was little, I, I don't know that I was very good at it. I would just do it all the time. Well, my mom tells a story that I was drawing under the desk in like kindergarten or first grade, and it was a math lesson. And the teacher was like, okay, well, let, wh what's your answer to the question? Since I was looking the other direction underneath the table drawing, and right away I answered the question correctly. And I wasn't even looking, I was looking the other way and I was under my desk and I was drawing in my book. My mom just tells that story because she, she was like, you were just a genius. You were, you know, you were so smart and you, you didn't even need to be looking at the board and you still knew what she was talking about while you were drawing underneath your desk. It was completely my own drive to, to be artistic and to do art. It wasn't ever coming from my family. They could have cared less whether I wanted to be an artist or something else. It didn't really matter to them. I sold some pieces at like garage sales. Like I would take my drawings down there, put them out, and I remember people bought them. And I was like in the second or third grade or something when that happened. When I was in high school, I think I started selling pieces. And then when I was 18 or 19, I had some pieces up in a coffee shop and Ben Moody, who was the, the writer and the guitarist for Evanescence, he bought everything in the coffee shop. And then he contacted me and wanted to meet me and then he hired me to paint his whole music studio in his house with, with spray paint. So paint the, the walls and the ceiling and everything. That was right away, like after just starting college and right away I was getting hired for like the graffiti style work that I was doing, that I was just doing on the side, putting up in places and putting up around places, so. 
My characters grew in size with time, and by the end of high school, my characters were much larger than they were. They, I was still working into walls that were like either like a boarded up window or just painting on boards that other people had painted on. My first two ways of doing work on the street was wheat paste and spray paint. First it was wheat paste because I was taking my drawings from my sketchbook, copying them on the copy machine, cutting them out, and then I had this little character that I could paste into an environment. Then I saw that everyone was using spray paint and the Venice walls are only like four blocks away from here. So I saw people using spray paint, I saw how they used it, and so I first got a few cans of spray paint and I would try to write a word or something into my little characters, like kind of overlapping them and then onto the wall. At first it was terrible, I didn't know you know, how to write with a spray can. I don't know what it looked like to other people, but to me it looked like a mess. And as I practiced and did more of them, I got better. By the end of high school, I, I knew really how to use spray paint, and that only developed over time more and more. The first set of walls that were large that I painted in, on with spray paint was Ben Moody's studio, but that was indoors, so it was a little different. It was all the walls and ceilings of the whole studio space. I started putting my art up in public when I was still in high school. I was living here in Venice, and I started putting it up around Venice. I did it because I wanted to do something outside of like art classes and what I was learning about art. I wanted to do something where no one was telling me what to do. So I would just took stuff out of my sketchbook because I always kept a bunch of sketchbooks and I would blow them up a little bit and I'd paste my little drawings all over the place. The wheat pastes were what I started doing when I was really young for myself in public. But I didn't do them in public to do them in public, I just did them in public because that was a space where nobody seemed to really care, especially in Venice at that time, and no one really cared if you put stuff up. No one told you you were doing something right or wrong. You just could do it and leave it and participate in what was happening on the street at the time, but not be criticized or critiqued. But it made me feel good about my art. And, and then I started writing into the pieces with spray paint. And then slowly, and I started actually painting them with spray paint. My inspiration comes from people. I've always liked drawing portraits of people. I find the emotions that people express in their eyes and in their beingness very interesting. The bits of history of, of the person that we can sense from their physical presence is super interesting. It's like a poetic testament to the life of the person in an abstract way, without direct facts or just with a feeling and, and like a sense of their being and what they've experienced. Every piece is different. Sometimes this process starts from photos that I'll take of the person. Sometimes it starts from sketches that I'll do of the person live. Sometimes it's a combination of those. It's usually in my sketchbook or on some piece of paper if I don't have my sketchbook. And then if it becomes a bigger piece, it's usually from the sketch that I do the bigger piece on a wall. I do a lot of things that are experimental. I'm always testing the limits of the way that I know my medium. Not always consciously, but I'm always pushing the limits. I use the tools that I know, but then I'm also constantly picking up new tools, doing things that are unorthodox. I'll grab a push broom, I'll put it in ink and I'll splatter it on the wall, or I'll rip half my shirt and like, you know, mess with the shirt. I'll take my bottle of water and throw it onto the wall and then hit it with spray paint. I'm always looking for new ways to use the tools and also break the boundaries of the way that drawings are done, the way that a painting is done. I love spray paint, it's an amazing tool. It's not very good for my body. The reason I continue to use spray paint is because there's nothing else that paints as effectively and as quickly and as beautifully. In one or two strokes with like a, a fat cap, I can do like shading on a cheek that is phenomenal. It looks amazing, it looks photorealistic. I have not found another medium that does that effectively the way that spray paint does. There's really no routine. Everything's very last minute with me all the time. If I go on a hunt for a subject, it's like usually like a quick one. I'm like, I need a subject. I think I've been successful 
because of pressure. And that's part of doing public walls. You only have a certain amount of time to do a public wall. If I did not have that pressure, I don't know that I would have been as prolific as I've been, not even close. You have to do it, you have to execute it, you have to get it done, and you know, it's a big thing, and then once it's done, you, you move on, and you do another. And each situation is so unique, it's hard to like encapsulate that. I mean, but I would say it's all with pressure. I mean, each piece is definitely a dramatic process, and it's definitely a dramatic performance from like beginning to end, whether you get to witness it all or not, it definitely is. It's extremely charged from beginning to end as well, and the actual painting of the mural is inevitably extremely performative because it's this huge space and you're kind of like a dancer on a stage, especially if you're painting fast, which I usually do. The movements are part of the piece, your physical movements. Your whole body becomes like a hand with a pencil or a hand with a brush a hand moving around a page, like you, that's how you move around a wall. So yeah, I mean, the, the performance aspect of it is, in my opinion, really exciting and beautiful. And it seems to be exciting and beautiful for people to watch it. And each wall is different. It's a more of an intuitive process and an improvisational process when you're acting on the painting. Like, I try to stop and think about it from time to time, but it's, sometimes it's hard to do. Once I finish a piece, sometimes I'm so exhausted from the piece, I don't even look at it when I leave. I just walk away. I know I'll see pictures of it from others, so I'm not too concerned. For me, like the idea of leaving these children and that I don't know what will happen to them, I'm not really attached one way or the other, but I think whatever happens to them is beautiful. Whether they get destroyed or whether they live, how they live is interesting if they do live. How they affect and communicate with people on their own is interesting. But the stories don't include me. The piece has done this on its own. And that, that's exciting and interesting to me. I started doing my little street art pieces in Venice when I was really young and that was like exciting to me and I did that. And then after that, I didn't feel the need to paint much stuff in Venice. Venice is so oversaturated kind of with art. I like going to places that don't have much art and painting there. I wouldn't say Venice is my turf. It's just my home. It's like my, where I'm from. The first outdoor stuff was probably stuff out in the desert, and I have no idea which one was the first one. It was the area, yeah, it was, out, it was painting out in the desert on like abandoned buildings. What I would paint here was like boarded up buildings that were being changed. So it was the boards. I would always usually paint on those boards. And so then out there, you've got all these old buildings that are falling apart, that are boarded up, or that are just falling apart. So the walls are obviously a safe space to work on. You feel like they are at least. It seems like no one, no one out there really cares what you're doing. So I felt safe there to work large. So that was probably when I was like 18, I started painting out there. Yeah, it's like my safe zone, like my safe, like my big sketchbook. Past Palm Springs, I've been going out to Lake Havasu since I was an infant because my grandma always had a house out there. She had a trailer out there on the little island for years and I was familiar with the road out there. So it was mostly stops along the road out there that I started painting. A lot of stuff out by the Salton Sea too. That was, a, it was off of the road out there. A lot of stuff out by Rice Road, which is um, a little road that you can take if you're going out to Havasu from, from LA, if you go past Palm Springs with a bunch of abandoned structures and things. So like Rice Road and, and Salton Sea, pretty much. When I started doing marathons, I thought that, you know, I had done something very challenging for myself. But then when I started painting the, these really big pieces, I realized that painting these murals was much harder than any marathon that I'd ever done. It's much more than just a, a physical activity, for sure, because you're hours by yourself in your own head. But the murals are, are many more hours than that, much longer on your feet, and much more of a challenge in all the ways, like your mind, your body, your soul, your stamina, everything. With each piece of art that I do, I don't think that I have a definitive 
thought out goal for it. I'm always trying to achieve like the representation of a feeling or the representation of, of something that I can't really describe, like a character that feels a certain way, that has a certain energy to her, and then I know when the piece has achieved that feeling. And I put everything I can into it to achieve that feeling. Really exhausting process to get that embodiment of that feeling onto the wall. But once it's there, I know, yeah, then it's done and then I leave it. I don't think much about what the piece will do from that point on. I don't think a lot about how my work will affect other people. I do it because I want to do it. I do it because I love doing it. And I'm always really like overjoyed when I see that it affects other people. I definitely enjoy adding something beautiful to a space, but I think every space is already beautiful to begin with. You know, I don't think that I'm making it necessarily more beautiful, but I like having the opportunity to add my creative input, my choice of what I would do with this space. I definitely do have those like moments that are extremely magical with my work, those moments where you get goosebumps. When I step back and a piece has like achieved something that I was going for, I get that feeling. I don't think about it as like an obsession in my mind either, but it, but it definitely is. It is undoubtedly like the description of an obsession. Each time I do a piece, I really don't do anything else until the piece is done. I am obsessed with the piece being what I feel it needs to be. And my bar for myself is very high for that. All my pieces are, they're these characters that are kind of, I say sometimes that they're representations of me. They're loose representations of me. Like they're, they're representations of me because I feel like that's all we can really truly represent, each of us. Most of my characters are women who are, they're based on a, another person, but then I'm also really embedding them with a lot of my own emotion. A lot of the times I want them to have, like with their look, or with, if they're looking directly at you or if they're looking away, I want them to have just a really strong feeling that I feel deeply and have felt deeply many times in my life within myself. And so that's, it's generally something very vulnerable, but also very strong and very powerful. I like abandoned spaces. I like like giant factory buildings that are abandoned. I like spaces that have been damaged somehow and abandoned and have that beautiful like decay occurring. There was a, a place out in the desert that was this old school, but the windows were all broken. But the windows were very blue, so you had this blue glass everywhere and like there was evidence of the kids being there going to school. I like things like that. I like working in spaces that have some sort of torn apart, decayed evidence of life. The decay of the space is available for you to then create something new in. A lot of the walls that I paint all over the world have some sort of multiple lives visible in the wall. Like you'll have maybe a broken piece of part of the wall that's cinder block or brick, and then a new part of the wall built up on another part of it. And so you have these multiple histories visible on this wall within a space that has many different things going on in it. That's part of the reason that I like working in public space because you're collaborating with like a whole environment. I like the desert a lot because of its like weird, vacant kind of quality that everything is just kind of dead or hiding and not a lot of stuff is out in the open. I was very artistic in the sense that I was doing the street art on my own. That was like going to the gym for yourself. It didn't matter to me if anyone ever knew I did that work. I did it because it was liberating. It kept my work organic and real. And I felt like with school, those two mediums of learning were very restrictive. What they were teaching you had all these confines. And so I didn't like that. I did it as a, as a tool for myself to just feel good about my work and to not feel claustrophobic. So I kept doing that so that I could be free. No one knew about that work that I was doing. No one really knew. And the two years that I went to Art Center at night, I was vice president of the school, and then the next year I was president of the school, so I was very popular. I was someone that everyone liked, for the most part, but also that no one really knew. So I was generally very liked and did well, and I was kind of an overachiever in certain ways, but then also I had this like rogue 
stuff that I would do on the side. Even the night school, like no one at my school knew about me going to college at night. That was something I did completely separate from all of those people and so was the work on the street. I'm always kind of been like a lone wolf, someone that's always gone off on my own and been fine with doing projects that excite me, always related to my art generally alone. I also ran like over 50 marathons alone because I liked running alone. It's the same as the work I was doing on the street. It was an activity just like the, the work on the streets that connected me with my soul, like myself, in a way that felt very good. I felt alive, but I also felt a deeply meditative, active connection with my being. So that's why I did that. I mean, the tank that I painted out on the edge of Slab City was like one of my dream things that I would have wanted to paint on. And I painted it and I loved that piece. Other spaces like that would be, I love old factories. I'd love to paint like on a big old factory wall. The Marshall Islands, where they covered up the atomic bomb that they set off, that I'd love to paint on that thing. It's probably really toxic to go there, but I feel like that would be an interesting thing to paint on. It's like this big round concrete thing that they just plastered on top of all this nuclear sewage that's on this little island in the middle of the Pacific. It's bleeding out into the ocean. Especially if you painted a portrait of like one of the people that was displaced by that atomic bomb occurring. It's, that's interesting to me. I haven't painted a lot of stuff in Venice. The one thing that I would like to paint in Venice that I haven't painted is my grandma's portrait on the side of her house. She lived here and she died here and, and she was born and raised in Venice. She was born in 1916 in Venice. I always wanted to be an artist. I remember my grandma would always say, a starving artist, haven't you ever heard of a starving artist? Like that's, if you're an artist, you're gonna be a starving artist. But eventually, you know, I remember her looking at my paintings like a little bit before she died and just sitting in her chair and saying, God, you're good. God, you're really good. And so eventually she just realized like that I wasn't gonna be a starving artist.